needs and that. And uh, in order to move forward at all, he's going to disappoint a lot of people because uh, so many people with so many different views have looked at him. But the, the <coughs> infection, the infectious nature of the concept of <coughs> that things can be better, that there is a way to be better, and something can happen. Without that, there is no way to really have justice without having hope. Uh, the Saint Augustine, of, I have studied to be a Catholic priest for a little while, so you'll hear some of that in what I say, but uh, uh, Saint Augustine of Hippo, who was uh, like five or six hundred, uh, five or six hundred years after Jesus was born, said, uh, uh, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Anger and courage. Uh, anger at the way things are and the courage to do something about it. And so hope is, again, like love, it's not just some sort of vague, misty cloud. It really is something that comes out of a clear-eyed look at what is going on in the world, uh, some critique about that, and possibly some passion in that critique, which results in anger. But that anger doesn't stop there. That anger combines with courage to do something about to not leave this the, the world the way that we, we came into it. Uh, the other part of hope that, that I find is that uh, is that I have been in uh, Egypt recently. I have been in India. I have been in Iraq. I have been in Haiti numerous times. I had been on death row. I unfortunately watched a client of mine being executed on death row. I have seen places be bombed. I have seen people die. I have seen tragedy and oppression. Um, but at the exact same point, the exact same point where the, <coughs> the edge of oppression and injustice cuts the hardest, at that exact same point, I have found people who display the most incredible courage, the most uh, incredible generosity, compassion, uh, and who actually can inspire all of the rest of us uh, with the way that they live their lives. So part of our job is to is to keep our uh, to keep our eyes open for injustice, because that's what justice people do. But also keep our hearts open for joy and love and that. Because if all we're focusing on is the injustice, then we're going to burn out. We're not going to stay at, at this work for long. So in addition to looking for the injustice to work on the justice, we have to look and recognize and uh, be in relationship with the people uh, who have the courage and the determination and the beauty uh, to teach us what to do. Because at the bottom, I think all of our justice work if it's authentic, it is about relationship. I've talked to a couple of you individually, individually about that. Is that I cannot be a, I cannot be involved in justice unless I am in some sort of just relationships with the people that I'm involved with. Whether it's co-workers, whether it's people in the institution that I work with, or it's people in the community or the individuals that I'm working with as well. Those cannot be, uh, as I talked with one student, it, social justice is radically different from paternalism. Social justice doesn't mean I know what's good for your community, so therefore I'm going to bring you this message or this gift that our community has brought. But that social justice means I, you and I, are in a relationship, and that you have some things to teach me, and hopefully I have some things that I can bring to you, and that together, you and I, and whoever you and I that you and I together can move forward in a spirit of, of justice so that we liberate each other, so that we are involved in a, in a quest for liberation together. And if we're not in a quest for liberation together, then it's something that I am giving you or you are giving me, and that's fine, but that's not justice. It's not justice. Uh, so we, that's our job, to look for that. The second thing that I think is very important is to edu continually educate ourselves about the history of the struggles for justice that went before us. And by, by that I mean everybody's heard of civil rights struggle, I've heard of women's rights struggle, I've heard of disability rights struggle, I've heard of uh, 
human rights struggle, those things, but to actually get into the nitty gritty details of the history. Because what we find out when we do that is that the, the, the glorious celebration that we have of Martin Luther King and the, and the civil rights movement is glorious, that they have made tremendous accomplishments. But there's a tendency to, to lift those folks up as if they were extraordinary human beings that are radically different from you and I. They are not, have not, were not, are not radically different than you and I. They are people that are subjected, and if you study their history, they, they, they fight over finances, they fight over who gets to be the, have their picture on the cover of the magazine, who gets to uh, claim credit for this event or that event, or, or who's the next person to be the lawyer that gets to argue before the Supreme Court and that sort of thing. They, are, they have the same uh, makeup as we do. They happen, however, by uh, uh, dedication, determination, creativity, and the like, they happen to have been on a, a journey of, towards justice <laughs> with a number of other people who were on a journey toward justice at the same time. The civil rights movement, for example, was never a movement. What it was was hundreds and hundreds of little movements that were happened at various times happened to be in harmony with each other. The groups in New Orleans were not planning strategy with the groups in Washington, D.C. most of the time. They were doing what seemed appropriate for them in their community. And then they saw that what was happening in other communities, they had lessons for each other, and that there were things that they could share, and that together they, they had a couple of common goals that they tried to overlap on, but that is what the movement is. The movement is made up of us. People like us that worked, that sacrificed, that dedicated, that were courageous and like just the same as the people who are in this room or any community that we're involved in. So learning those histories, though, shows us, for example, as somebody said, how do you persuade somebody, a foundation, to give you some a, a grant to work in a community or give the community a grant to work on an issue that we know we won't have success for for a year or something like that? And, and, and may just be failures. How do you suggest that people fund the idea of failure? I said, well, you, we have to understand that the history of justice, the history of success in justice, is for every success, there are a dozen or more uh, what some people might call failures, but we would call steps in the path, in the journey toward justice. Uh, the, the analogy that a community organizer used with me that's the best, I think, is this idea of a pot of uh, room temperature water. That our goal is to bring that pot to boil. Okay, well, uh, maybe we work at it for a certain amount of time and we bring it up to 120 degrees and then we, that's the end of our contribution. Somebody else brings it from 120 to 160 and somebody else brings it up in that. But at some point it's going to boil. Okay? At what point do you figure out who made the contribution to what that happened? In our experience, usually what happens is the people who were there when it went from uh, 210 to 2 something, uh, that we claim the credit for making it boil, because uh, you know, the boil while we were there, we were doing it, so obviously, well, no, as our, as our time of silence at the beginning said, it boiled then, not just because of what we did, which is certainly important, but because of all the other people who worked so long to try to turn that heat up, and were unable to bring it to a boil, but participated in creating the circumstances for that. An abolitionist in 1820, they worked for 10 years on abolition and died at that point. Were they a failure? Did they die a failure? In one sense, they did. But in another sense, they paved the way. They created opportunities. They built a foundation that other people came along to build upon. So learning those histories of social justice struggles help us place our work in a, in a proper context. The other thing that people said, uh, I asked them about you know, the, the title they used at the Yale conference on this rebellious lawyer. And uh, one guy told me, a, fellow, a friend of mine who works in Oregon, but he is one of the primary human rights lawyers in Haiti, where I have been uh, a number of times. He said, if you want to be a rebel lawyer, you have to join the rebel army. Another one said, there, there are no solo acts, A-C-T-S, no solo acts in social justice. It is a team sport. And so 
So the idea that we have to work in community with organizations, I think all of those are dimensions of the part of that it is not something that any of us can do by ourselves. Uh, a student this morning said the experience, I thought was great, the experience of law school is atomizing, right? And you have to read your book to prepare your notes so that when the teacher calls on you, you don't what? Embarrass yourself, right? That's the whole goal of law school. <laughs> it's not that we're so wise, not that we're so brilliant and excited with it, it's just to not embarrass ourselves. Um, but in fact, in terms of justice work, it, even if there's one person who knows what they're doing, unless the rest of the team knows, unless the rest of the team is participating, uh, it, it's, it's impossible to go forward. Um, Susan uh, uh, Linta works with the EEOC. And she said when she was a law student, she really anguished about what career path to take. And uh, she was asking everybody for advice. And uh, she didn't know whether to do the traditional route or the interest route or whatever. And she said, I honestly didn't know what to do until one day a friend told me, asked me, what would you do if you had no fear? And none of us had no fear. We all had fears. So there's another way to say, what would you do if you could handle your fear? And she said, when that person asked me, that was the right time. And so I decided to go ahead and make a grab for the thing that I really wanted to do. And it was the greatest decision that I ever made in my life. Because I worked it out. I was able to make it happen. So, it, so it, I think it's inappropriate to say no fear. Because we all are plagued with Every, every one of us has fears. But it is, how would I operate if I could overcome my fear? And I think that that uh, is part of the whole idea of freeing ourselves, freeing our minds. Because we can't go where we don't dream. Uh, law school, one, one of the things I think is, uh, when I did this, uh, I, some law students in New Orleans the first Christmas after Katrina. And uh, they were at the end of a week. And they just had a little a circle that we all got into and everybody said how what they had experienced in life. And a couple of people were crying. And one of the women was crying was saying, uh, she was crying because in this house that was upside down that she had found, there was a little Madonna in the backyard that was exactly like the Madonna in her mother's bed. So the connection between this total stranger and herself was just made so clear to her at that time. And somebody else told another story, but the last person to talk was a, was a male student who cried, who was crying and said, I just thought this trip was so great and it reminded me, you know, what I'm supposed to be about. He said, because, you know, the first thing I lost in law school was the reason that I came. And you had a much better opportunity in this school than most students have in the other 150 plus schools around the country. But even then, uh, it is important to reclaim those dreams that brought you here in the first place. And because we don't talk about dreams that much in, in a lot of those courses that we have to take. Uh, but to reclaim those dreams, and because if you're not dreaming, you're not going to be able to get to that dream. <coughs> Reclaim the dream, readjust it in light of what you have learned, and, and go forward. Uh, there's a quote, one of the people said, this is, this is the thing that kept me going through law school, was this quote from On the Road. It said, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify them, or vilify them, but the one thing you can't do is ignore them, because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world, they are the ones who are going to do it. Another thing that a couple of people uh, suggested to me is something that we, is a word that we don't talk about in law school very much, is humility. Uh, I don't know why, you know, uh, <laughs> maybe 
and that's what, you know, because of who we are, why we came here, right? Uh, but the humility to shut up, sit down, and listen. Uh, you have to do that more as a student, obviously, than the teachers have to do. Uh, but it's also something that's very difficult for lawyers to do, maybe because you decide you want to be like the teachers instead of uh, the students. Um, the, as one lawyer said, the wisdom of humility is endless. Because the truth is, we know so very little about what's going on in the world. We know, uh, and, and we have so much to learn, and every time that we're with another person or another group, it is an opportunity to learn. But so many times we get anxious about the quiet or anxious about the, the stillness, and we feel that we have to fill it up with saying something. In my experience, I've been to law school, I've been to a, a, a university, I graduated from Purdue in the Midwest. But the best teachers that I've ever had in my career, the best teachers that I've ever had in my career are some grandmothers who live in public housing developments in the city of New Orleans. People, by and large, may not even have a high school degree, but they have the experience and the insight and the tenderness uh, and creativity to live on uh, resources that I couldn't begin to make last a week and they make it last usually most every day of the month, someday not every day of the month, uh, but the, those mothers and my relationships with them, the grandmothers, uh, over my 30-year uh, uh, career, uh, they have been the best teachers. I've learned a lot of skills from other people, but they have been the best teachers. So, where we learn and who we learn from uh, is something about that we have to find that out. It's not necessarily in the traditional place. Uh, one of my friends, uh, one of my grad, my students who was a graduate said, Bill, uh, make sure that everybody knows in order to be a justice lawyer, you don't have to be an asshole. <laughs> and uh, I would have thought, thought that we understood that already. But he made it a point that was his big suggestion. His suggestion to me, so uh, as his teacher, I said, uh, go back to the humility section. Uh, others said it uh, you know, uh, a little less direct. Uh, one lawyer said that when I got my first job after law school uh, working in shelter, uh, the woman who was interviewing me told me that she wanted to work with me because she knew I would be comfortable sitting on the floor. And this was her suggestion to me, is that we have to be flexible enough uh, in terms of uh, what we're going to do, that we can't always think or act like a lawyer. Okay? We spend all this time in law school helping learn how to think like a lawyer. But there are parts of being a lawyer that we need to be optional in our lives as well. <laughs> the insight, ability to analyze, uh, to think, that is all critically important. But being a lawyer isn't how you dress, or where you dress, or where you sit, or how you sit. Uh, it is something else. Um, one friend of mine said, here's my list of what a super lawyer would do. <laughs> Volunteer to make the copies. Uh, make phone calls. Ask lots of questions. Defer credit to coworkers. Um, understand that sometimes our friends know not a lot more about law than we who are lawyers. Somebody who doesn't use a lot of Latin. <laughs> uh, everybody who switches their pads and notebooks to eight and a half by eleven <laughs> makes enough coffee for everybody and buys the intern's lunch. Uh, some things that go against the status, really, is what it is. Status of being a lawyer. The privilege that we have as a result of going through this process. We are fortunate to go through it. We learn a lot through it. We have things to offer. But that does not confer upon us a, 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 an ability to not be the contributor in the same way that everybody else is. And I think that's the message in terms of that. Uh, another thing that I would say is, 
it, again, part of this thing of being a lawyer is that there is a natural tendency to think up, okay? To look up. That there are other lawyers, there are people who just got out of law school who made a lot more money than us, who had maybe more glamorous jobs than us. I cannot compete against your odds. <laughs> that we call in uh, uh, liberation theology the preferential option for the poor. Don't we'll just stand over there. Oh. Oh. Not that you're boring, but <laughs> competition is everything. Right? Uh, a preferential option for the poor and oppressed. Because that thing about what you see depends on where you stand. So constant in, in our society, in our culture, in that is a constant looking up. Who's making more money? Who is uh, more famous? Who has more impact? That stuff. As opposed to looking at who cleaned this room? You know? Who cooked this food that we have? Uh, who's going to be cleaning this room, you know, tonight after we're all in another place? Who serves us our food? Who takes care of our kids? Who takes care of our parents? Who checked us out this morning when we got coffee or that sort of stuff? Who are the people that actually sort of keep the world running. And to understand that we can't, the, the, the preferential option for the poor and oppressed says that we can't talk about the top or the middle unless we're also talking about the people who are usually overlooked. And that is not, again, not a question of paternalism, but understanding that the person who's playing in this room is a mother just like my mother just like your mother, just like your daughter, that stuff. And that we have an obligation to understand that their human dignity and their human worth and their insight and, their, and what they can share with us is every bit as important as the person who's sitting up here uh, with a, a, a temporary title conferred by uh, Northeastern for the last couple of days. And to understand that that takes work, that takes, uh, that takes uh, a, a constant reorienting ourselves away from the rich and the famous and away from looking to the top of the hill, but to look around, look around us and understand who we are with and where we participate. Uh, Gandhi has this quote, and uh, Gandhi said, think of the poorest person you have ever seen and ask if your next act will be of any use to them. It's not any use for them, any use to them. Is anything that we are going to do of use to the poorest people we know. And that's a great way to help make decisions, help to decide priorities and the like, again, in a way that has solidarity, not this paternalism of we know what's best for everybody else. And how do we find out? If we don't know what's best for the poor and oppressed, we don't know what's best for the people in Haiti, because we don't know that many people, then what are we supposed to do about it? We don't look it up in a book to try and find it out. <laughs> We don't look it up in a book. We go to the people of Haiti and we ask them, what can I, you know, what can we do together? What can I do? And what can you teach me? And so this option for the poor and oppressed means that we just constantly reevaluate. It doesn't do me much good to have a clock if I can look at it. Uh, two or three things and I'll stop. I uh, was at a just got back from spending a week in Nicaragua. And each one of them was dropped off in a different village, and they lived with a family that had no running water, no electricity, and they weren't even in contact with each other. They were only in contact with that family. And, I, and they were profoundly, their lives were profoundly altered by the time that they spent the first. And I asked them, how did you ever decide to do this? I mean, where do you find the, the ability to First, you have to be willing to be uncomfortable. And I think that a willingness for us to be uncomfortable is one of the things that we constantly have to do in order to press our own envelope, in order to put ourselves in places where we might learn new things, and not just to stay in the, the groove or the, the, the environment where we feel good, but 
to be willing to get out there where people don't necessarily understand us, we don't necessarily understand them, that we have to take a risk. So this idea of us being willing to be uh, make ourselves uncomfortable is part of it. But there's a flip side to that. And that flip side is the willingness to be able to make other people uncomfortable. And uh, the challenge of that, it's, it's, I could just scream into this microphone, that would make everybody uncomfortable. <laughs> so that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is how do we make other people uncomfortable but uh, in a way that it is not so uncomfortable they just shut down. And that is a real, and it's a, any lawyer, uh, any advocate anywhere, any teacher can tell you that is something that we struggle with our entire lives to figure out how to do that better and better. And so that is something that we need to learn. We need to help, in a sense, be communicators, be bridges to help the voices of people who aren't usually heard be heard in places where they need to be heard. And that makes other people uncomfortable. But whether we, we have to find a way to make people uncomfortable, but in a way that they will listen and they will sit with that for a little while and not be so afraid that they'll just turn around and leave, either mentally or whatever. Um, uh, one uh, person who works at uh, Equal Justice Works so, said, I, I once asked a friend of mine for some career advice and his response to me was stunning. He said, you're holding yourself back. Be your best. Do more. Take risks. And um, there are times that we have to hold ourselves back. You know? But there are times that we need to take some risks. And we have to be willing to be uncomfortable. I guess the last thing I'm going to say is this I, is to repeat something that I think you've heard some of it earlier, is that in order to uh, be involved in justice work, you have to be working on justice yourself. In order to spread understanding of hope and love, that you have to love yourself. We can't give away what we don't have. Okay, you can't say that too many times. Um, so loving and caring for yourself is an important part of being a social justice lawyer. Because unless you are healthy in the balance, the balance that is good for you in terms of mental health, physical health, social health, and the like, unless you are healthy, you are not going to be in a position to help other people get healthy. Unless you are healthy, you are not going to be in a position where you can be creative. And unless you're healthy, you're not going to be in a position where you can take personal risks and you can take intellectual risks and that either whether it's being, going to a place that you've never been before, you're willing to be physically uncomfortable, or hanging out with people that you don't really know that well and willing to be uh, uh, uncomfortable in that fashion. It is imperative that we love and care for ourselves. A friend of mine who's a public defender, is working 70 and 80 hours a week and getting drunk with your coworkers on Fridays happens sometimes but it is not a sustainable lifestyle. <laughs> not taking care of yourself will affect you negatively and affect your work and lessen your ability to serve your clients. For lack of a better word, it's okay to be selfish once in a while. Selfish in the sense of becoming healthy again. We live in a profession and in a world that values overwork, that values overcommitment, values overcompensation, values materialism, these sort of things. So to say I can be satisfied with something else, a healthier lifestyle, is a challenge. Because that's not the way that our, our, our culture, our, our lawyer's culture, or our larger culture uh, talks to us at, at all. Um, humor is so important. Uh, and, but you have to be careful. Okay? Uh, because uh, that's where you need your circle of friends and that, because things that uh, a bunch of public defenders can joke about are usually not all that funny to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> seem a little bit ill, actually. <laughs> but uh, if you're in that environment, you're in that community, you know, you, and you know the importance of the release. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this one from my friend Pam Carlin, who's a teacher of civil rights lawyer. 
If I could give uh, people one piece of advice about being a lawyer that they're not likely to hear in very many places, it is to read poetry and literature and art and uh, to look for things of beauty. Things of beauty will help keep our minds clear of jargon. Um, and she concludes with the last line in the, uh, Robert Frost and then uh, a, a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes that I'll, I'll finish with this quote of Oliver Wendell Holmes, 1883. Through our good fortune, in our youth, our hearts were touched with fire. It was given to us to learn at the outside that life is a profound and passionate thing. Above all, we have learned that whether a man or woman accepts from fortune her spade and will look downward and dig, or from aspiration her axe and cord and will scale the ice, the one and only success which it is to him or her to command is to bring to their work a mighty heart. And so I would say that to you in conclusion that if we don't remember other things, social justice is about skills, it's about determination, it's about hard work, it's about passion. It's keeping things alive for a long time as much as you can. But you have to take care of your heart because if, if you do it right, it's going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And it needs the exercise, but it also needs all the rest of the things that we're talking about. So with that, uh, I thank you for inviting me.
It's often not enough. And if it's not enough, it's, it's, uh, I have found that the best thing is to reach out beyond law school. You're fortunate because in the second and third year, you do these, you have the opportunity to do these magnificent, uh, uh, have these magnificent learning experiences. But in 1L, for the second semester, you have to start now. You can't wait for the second year to do it because of what you need. And there are people who need you even if it's for five hours a week or six hours a week, whatever you can give. In my experience, those are the things that kept me sane and kept it possible for me to continue the grind after that first semester. Yes, uh, I was wondering, I'm, I'm not a professional counselor, but I was wondering if change and structural change, that is made up of hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of individuals who have uh, those experiences. And there are some lawyers who say, all I want to do is the structural institutional reform. I don't want to deal with one-on-one -on -one sort of charity case stuff. Well, I know that's the, it's the thing, the difference between, some people call it the difference between charity and justice. It's individual stuff is charity and, and other stuff is justice. And I think that's a false and I find that um, there are many times when the work, the structural or class action or big or legislative work that we're doing is actually failing again and again and again. And the only way to be able to succeed as a lawyer and to continue is by <coughs> learning from the individual grandmother or the individual client that we are able to help by the working with them, understanding their lives, the challenges that they're up against, and hopefully being able to assist them. I was with one student, I don't know if they're in here or not, they uh, saying they didn't know what they could do in that and they just won a very important unemployment compensation case for somebody who hasn't had a job or a check since sometime in the fall. Now that may not seem like law reform, but in terms of that person, their children, that family, and probably the extended family who's been taking care of that person since then, that is a big step forward in terms of uh, social justice. So, I think it is a combination of looking for the, 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 the diamonds and the jewels and the things that are there with, with whatever we're doing, but also at the same time trying to get some balance between working on individual things and working on uh, uh, the more systemic things that create the individual problem. And it is a, it's an ongoing challenge, and each one of us strikes at a slightly different balance, I think. And Lucy, why don't you answer that as well? Because you had plenty of experiences with all of them. No, I agree completely with what you said. I, don't <laughs> I do not have a dichotomy between individual work and systemic work. I think they are they are completely merged, one and the same in many ways. But that is not, I don't know for Lucy, but for me, that was not the way I always thought. About That's right. It, is that I had in my head, and maybe I don't know where I got it, but that 
this box contained what social justice lawyering was. And unless I got in that box, it wasn't social justice lawyering. And what I have found out in the years that go by is that not only is it just not that box, the box is so large, in fact, maybe it's not even a box, is that there, there is no limit to the way that people can bring about justice in this world. Some of us have the gift and the excitement to do it individually. Some of us have the gift and excitement to do it different way. Many of us have to do a variety of approaches, but all of those things are good. I know when I started law school, I wouldn't have believed it, but uh, a number of years ago, a woman came to me, she said, I am so passionate about social justice, but I can't find anybody uh, to mentor me. And I said, well, tell me, she lived on the West Coast. And she said, yeah, because I'm an expert in tax, <laughs> and I want to do social justice tax. And I was at a loss for words, really, because that, you know, social justice tax work is not the local well, words don't always go together. You know, the people that I hang around with. But the more I thought about it, is this, you know, and, and did just a little bit of research, it's tremendous needs to for people who can understand the tax system, they can also bring to bear the, the issues of justice, even just to translate that for the rest of us who don't understand the tax system and can say, you know that this change is occurring that is going to directly impact people who are working full time, or people trying to get their first house, or people trying to go into bankruptcy to get rid of A, B, C, and D. And I don't know that because that's not my world. So I think as, as my experiences have grown, so has my understanding that there is no one social justice job. And there is, in a, in a sense, I don't think there really is a, there probably is, but there, there are few jobs that can't be, can't become social justice job because of what you do in that job. Not that that's the way everybody else is doing it, but because of what you do. And that goes back to this thing, don't let anybody tell you that you can't do that dream that brought you to law school. Now, one of the unfortunate side effects of law school is there are fewer people with dreams that leave than showed up in the community. Okay? That's of every law school. This law school probably does a better job than most. But it is true that the process of legal education shrinks people's goals of dreams. And I don't know exactly why. Uh, I have some guesses, and I'm sure you have some guesses too. But don't let anybody tell you you can't do that dream that brought you here. And even though you haven't seen anybody else that has done it, you can do it. And then you'll be talking about it and explaining to everybody else. Yeah, right
just the ones that I participated in to, you know, to a little bit. Of, I would, I, I, and I do think in terms of this thing, there is no social, solo social justice act, that by participating in those movements, and participating meaning not, I show up, I'm a lawyer, what can I do for you? But look, I am a lawyer, but I'm, I'm also interested in just so I'm interested in accompanying this group and you as you find out new things so I can become more educated about it and become one of the people in the group in a relationship that uh, you will have many opportunities of people to share stuff with you that you will learn and they will have many opportunities to get stuff from you in return. So I think it's, it's a very important question, very important thing to do in your career as a lawyer and even before that if it's at all possible. Carolyn, tell us about getting arrested. <laughs> uh, tell us about getting arrested is a question. Um, it's a, a little YouTube of things. I don't know if you ever seen it. <laughs> I really, uh, I've been in a lot of things where I consciously knew there was a chance I might get arrested. You know, where I was helping other people who were engaging in civil disobedience and maybe I was too close to the line myself or a little bit over. But when I got arrested, for those of you who don't know, it's a, a, a year ago last December, there was a sort of a spontaneous protest in the city council of New Orleans when, uh, the, again, these wild grandmothers, uh, about 25 of them showed up and asked to be put on the agenda to talk about the impending demolition of their homes. And uh, the council didn't want to be put it on the agenda and they folks stayed and that sort of stuff. And then they said, okay, we'll put it on the agenda. It'll give you 15 minutes. So they gave 15 minutes and all they did was let people speak in the microphone. And no response whatsoever. Nobody made a single response. So the grandmother said, look, and they said, okay, thank you very much. Now we're going to move on with the meeting. And my grandmother said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, these are our homes. You know, we didn't come up here just to fail. We wanted, you know, tell us something. What do you think we can do about it? What can you do to help us about it? What can be done, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, we gave you 15 minutes, and we're going to go on with the meeting. And so the mother started... Uh, singing and chanting and that sort of stuff. So there's only about 20 of them. But uh, so they did that, so the city council took a break, they came back after the break, and the mothers started up again because they wouldn't do it. And so then the police started pulling the mothers out of the city council chambers. And there, I was at a doorway with a mother, her daughter, and her granddaughters, three generations of, of moms there in the doorway, and they were trying to slam the door because they're trying to close all the doors and lock all the doors and pull everybody out of one door. And they're trying to slam the door on these ladies. So I had my heels back up against the door so that it was impossible to move. And so the, the, the deputy or whatever was trying to slam the door, but it, it couldn't do it. And uh, so there was a whole bunch of deputies all over the place. And the next thing I knew, um, all of a sudden, just grabbed and yanked from I had a sport coat on and good clothes and all stuff to talk to the city council. And fortunate for me, there was an independent journalist who was right there from New York City who was in town for a conference. And she just happened to come over and she heard something on the radio. And so she was filming this whole thing, which I didn't know. And uh, so this guy threw me up against the wall and he turned me around. And, you know, at that time I was fine, but then I think he really, he didn't communicate. <laughs> I think he was trying to force me to get on the ground without saying that. And I had on my good clothes, and uh, I didn't want to get them all dirty. And, uh, you know, this all happened in just a couple of seconds. But uh, ultimately, he handcuffed me behind my back and, and, and took me out into a temporary police uh, building that they had outside. Because after Katrina, we had so many temporary buildings. And he said, I'm going to arrest you. And I said, well, look, even if you're going to arrest me, don't worry, I'm not going to sue you for this. And I thought I was being nice, but he thought I wasn't. So, uh, he went ahead and started writing out a, a, a citation for me. And all these people, by this time, people had come from all over the city to be a part of this protest. There's maybe 100 people out there now. So all of a sudden, we're in this little temporary building, and the building starts shaking. And, and my friends and clients are outside saying, Unless you release Bill, we're going to turn this building over. <laughs> and I go, no, no, I'm in the building. <laughs> Get another tactic, please. <laughs> uh, and, but, uh, ultimately, they released me. The officer apologized. And nothing ever happened with, with the, uh, the arrest itself. But I tell you, an interesting thing is, after the 
arrested me, I felt guilty. <coughs> you know, I felt like, gee, I must, I really, I wasn't planning on getting arrested. That wasn't the goal of what I was doing, and I felt, gee, I really messed this up somehow. And now the focus was shifted to the five o'clock news, six o'clock news, civil rights lawyer arrested at the city council and all that. And I went out, and people were so, so wonderful. They were crying and all this other stuff. Said, you know, arrest me, don't arrest my water. And uh, it was it was really beautiful. And um, uh, but it was unexpected, and it was something I really didn't know uh, how to respond to. So I was very flustered, as they say, for some time, trying to figure this out, and see what I had could have done differently. As it turned out, uh, the group figured a good way to use it as an organizing tactic, and it brought a lot of other people out for the next protest. But uh, it was a very disorienting. sense of fun, I guess maybe living in New Orleans may have helped you, I would appreciate that. Um, I guess I wanted to ask you if you'd talk a little more about how that struggle has, has, how it went and how it has continued in New Orleans, especially as it relates to the fight over public housing. It was just appalling, uh, obviously, the way they moved forward in authorizing, in reauthorizing the demolition of public housing, including, irrespective of the probably more important social dimension, this incredibly historic, uh, one of the projects you know better than many of us, I guess, the, the Lafitte project, uh, which were this incredibly important historic buildings from the Depression era. Um, so they had value in all these multi multiple uh, dimensions. Um, so where is that struggle going? Uh, and, and specifically, this is a little embarrassing maybe, but I think you deserve a right, to re a right of reply, and I'm curious. 
in that fight, you were just describing the arrest, I, I remember seeing the, the chief of police being interviewed and being asked explicitly about you, and he said, well, what can you say about Bill Quigley? I, I, you know, as if you were some kind of you know, goofy character. Um, and I just wonder how you would respond to that and how you deal with that kind of, I, I don't think it was appropriate for him to be saying, making a comment like that at all anyway, but how you respond in the ongoing struggle to those kinds of situations. Well, I'd say uh, uh, one thing is I know that again tomorrow we're going to talk specifically about Katrina at some length. Somebody know what time that is? 2.30 to 4.30. 2.30 to 4.30. So for those of you in the room who would like to do some more about that, we're going to do that. Um, New Orleans is, I'd say, like at 60%. Um, we had 450, maybe 480,000 people before Katrina hit, which is three and a half years ago. Today we have somewhere around 300,000 people. So we have a hundred and a couple of tens of thousands of people who have never made it back. Some certainly chose not to make it back, but for many people it was not a choice. There was no place to come home to. And that's about the end of the line in terms of, you know, we don't expect a lot more migration in terms of people coming back. In terms of the public housing, we chose that as one of the fights because it was with 5,000 units of public housing that survived the storm in really good shape, particularly compared to every place else in the city. And we figured if uh, Katrina survivors weren't entitled to be able to come back to their apartments, federally funded apartments, who was? And so, uh, but ultimately we lost that fight. You know, everything, uh, 4,910 apartments been demolished, and all that's left is just vacant ground. Not a single one has been rebuilt. And that was a conscious effort by people to take advantage, and they say it openly, this, the, 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 the disaster offers us a chance to start over and start better. And so people, for a couple of things go on at the same time. One is, these were the largest undeveloped tracts of land, uh, and the only ones that you can actually throw people off of and have opportunities for private developers to do something about. Secondly, they were filled with the most powerless people in our community, which you can find, at least in our community, and I don't know about everybody else's community, but if you plot the intersection of race, gender, and class, you will find the people least likely to have returned to New Orleans, and in all of our communities, you will find the people who are uh, least likely to have political and economic control over their lives. So we have lost 40-something thousand African-American voters from the city of New Orleans. Registered voters, it's not just kids. And we have a, almost exactly half the number of children in public school who were in public school three and a half years ago. And of our public schools, there something like 70% are charter schools now. So we are, it is, some people see it as a great opportunity to experiment. Experiment with charter schools, get rid of all public housing, come up with whole new ways to do it. And the people who lived in there, the people who are my friends, people that I represent, people that I've known for decades, they were considered just people, I mean, people who could be moved. And that we thought, we being the, you know, those in, in control in, in Washington, D.C. and in New Orleans, we thought that we knew better than they did what they should, where they should live. And that they're better off in Houston, or better off in Memphis, or better off in Atlanta. And the fact is, they might actually be living in a nicer apartment in Houston, but they don't live with their family. And they don't live by their church, and they don't live next to their doctor, and the kids don't get to go to the same school, and the, their grandparents aren't in the neighborhood anymore, and all these other things that we count as part of life. Uh, so in, in, in one sense, we lost that fight. Although the litigation is still going on, we have already houses that the litigation is still going uh, but uh, there were some victories, and some of those victories were that a number of the public housing mothers and grandmothers emerged as uh, significant citizens in the discussion of social justice in the city of New Orleans. That they got used to being on TV and being interviewed and speaking before the city council and learning how to uh, uh, get people out and to do things like that. 
greatest city in the country, but it just it didn't happen on one weekend, and it didn't happen to 5,000 units all at the same time. They'll do it, they'll isolate one neighborhood and, and depopulate that and then get rid of that. So it does offer, in a, in a good sense, it does offer, the disaster offers us a lens, a way to look at the way money and decision making is done in, in our name in the United States. And uh, we still have a long way to go with that. In terms of the last thing, in terms of people saying, well, Bill Quigley, you know, I think that, what that means is, you know, he, he complains about everything. You know, he complains about uh, tasering and uh, pepper spraying people who were trying to get into a city council meeting. That was at the time that he did that. Um, uh, you know, some of that comes with the territory. It is unfair. You don't like it. My wife can tell you, I mean, it's, it, sometimes I've gone to a grocery store in New Orleans and halfway through the grocery store, some guy will come up to me, and he'll just be angry. I don't know who he is, or he knows who I am because of television or something. And he'll come up to me, just out of the blue in the grocery store, and say, well, what the hell is your plan? <laughs> <laughs> and so some of that, you know, it comes with the territory. And it's unfortunate. It doesn't feel good. You don't like it. Uh, and doesn't, you know, but you know, you hopefully, that there are people who do support. part of the price that you pay. And then, you know, when I feel sorry for myself and that sort of stuff, I say, well, you know, at the end of the day, I get to go back to my house. And the people that I represent, they're not going back to their houses. You know, they're being on the bus and going back to Houston, or they're going into another place that, you know, somebody has to give them a ride. The final thing I would say on this, I know we're sort of out of time, is these grandmothers are so cute. They have like tiny things that are, you know, even older than I am. But when I go to bring them to their house, after a meeting, I'll drive some of them home. They won't they, they arranged the drop-offs, and I didn't even understand this the first couple of times I did it. They arranged where I would drop two or three of them off in such a way that I am not left by myself in a bad neighborhood at the end of the drop-off. <laughs> so they will say, well, go take her home first, and then you're going to come back and leave me, and that sort of stuff. But they are very protective of me. You may have my size or anything else, but they're very protective. I want to make sure that uh, little old Bill can figure out a way to get home. So their love protection and advocacy for me uh, is, uh, you know, something that uh, is really awesome and gives you a lot of energy to be able to fight with them, no matter what the chief of police or other people. Thank you so much, Bill.